God is good. At all the time. God is good. We do have a few announcements for you this morning. The nursery is available. Uh, church Family Appreciation Day is today. Uh, we did announce it last week. The Irish should have gone out this week. I know several people told me they didn't get the Irish. And if it starts, it goes into Charleston Baptist Church would like to, Charleston Baptist Church would like to, Charleston Baptist Church would like to. If you continue to listen, sometimes it does play, sometimes it doesn't. But if you would get on the email for that, as soon as you hear Charleston Baptist Church would like to, you can do like I do and hang up on it. And then check your email to see what it is. Or like most people do, they'll call the church and ask them what it was. And so um, this afternoon, starting at 4 o'clock, uh, we will have uh, cornhole and we'll have whatever games you'd like to bring. If it rains, we'll come inside, we'll play parkour, we'll play cars, we'll do whatever, we'll have some good time and fellowship together. And, uh, and then we will eat at 6. Uh, the pig is cooking now. And so Christian and I provide the pig. If you'll just bring the sides uh, and desserts, whatever you'd like to eat with that. We'll have tea and lemonade and water. If you want something else to drink other than that, just bring whatever you'd like to drink for yourself. And everything else will be provided for you in that. So if you'll just be with us this afternoon, we'd love to have you be with us. Uh, Nash County WMU Fall Meeting is September 13th at 10 a.m. at Union Missionary Baptist Church out on 97. And the cost is $5 per month. If you have any questions, you can see Ms. Joyce. Radiance is Friday, September 16th at 6.30 p.m. Don't forget to bring your favorite finger foods. Uh, and our next, uh, I'll save that for the end. Uh, care, the next care meal will be Wednesday, September 21st. Uh, September is North Carolina Missions Offering. It covers a variety of missions, including the Baptist Union and church plants, if you'd like to give to that as an offering that they're take, taking that up uh, this month. Also, uh, blessing, blessing bags for the homeless, we're still collecting for that, so we can make all those up. I think right now the only thing we're short on is Bibles. And so if you have little Bibles that you can put in those bags, that would be great to bring those, and we put those in there. Um, also, Radiance ladies uh, who made a plate, please see Crystal and pick up your plates. If you haven't already, after church, see her. Uh, we have two little girls also uh, that are going to Princess of the King that needs a guardian to go with them. They don't have a guardian to be with them, and what they do in Princess of the King is they have a mom that goes, so if you're a lady in here and you have a, you don't have a little girl and you have boys or you would be willing to say, hey, you know what, my little girl's older and she's there, I'd like to sponsor one of these little girls to go with them through that because they do have time when they break off, especially in different places and times during the night and pray together and with the mom and their, and their daughters and things. So these two little girls don't have a mom to come here with them. So if you would, uh, if you're willing to do that, please see Kristen in that and uh, have one more announcement for you and one more play for you.
uh, he called me this week and said, called me on Friday and said, hey man, called me earlier this week and said, hey, talked about something. And uh, when he told me that, I said, uh, I said, man, that's great. That's wonderful to do. We'd love to, we'd love for you to come do that. And uh, he's coming home this weekend. And so I'll uh, be in prayer for him with safe travel. And uh, he is a very mature young man for his age. And I see God doing amazing things in his life. I'm thankful for him. So, uh, if you don't understand or you didn't understand what he said, $5 gift cards, we're we'll going to go to the food line up here at 97, give those out, $5 to $10 max. Um, we're going we're gonna to collect those up today and Wednesday, so if you would like to donate those, uh, turn those in, you can get them at the food line also, and we're just going to invite them to church and ask them if you can pray with them about something or something in their life you need to pray about, and so we can go out and do that Saturday from 1 to 3. I love what he said. He said he didn't want to mess up anybody's dinner plans. If you know Matthew, he's kind of like a self to eat. And uh, he puts a lot of pictures up of his food. And so uh, if you would, uh, keep giving your prayers for that too. For our ushers to come forth at this time, we'll take up his tithes and our offerings. <laughs>
see what that last part said? It's okay. You see what that last part said we remember? I really don't think we did. But their church is a fact. I remember. I remember exactly where I was at when it happened. I remember I was in my fire car and I stopped and stopped Crystal's dad and then saw it on the TV and they called every fireman in Wilson back to the main station. They called everybody to leave their station to come back. And, and then all of a sudden the, the second, second plane hit in that, in that distance. And you know what? We had a prayer meeting with our church that night. It was a Tuesday night. I'll never forget it. And I thought, man, you know, people came out on Tuesday night, packed church, and for the next few weeks, the next few months, the churches were packed out because people were scared because they thought the end of the world was coming. You know what? As I thought about this week, I thought, you know what? I think we need to share something. I think we need to remember, but I think we also need to remember what we did. We drew closer to God, and now we're further away from them than we've ever been. Our churches are further away from them than we've ever been. Our families are further away from them than we've ever been. And we wonder why people are lost and why people are, are, are not getting saved. And it's not because of the world. It's not because of the government. It's not because of anything. It's because of us as a church. We're not doing our job. I saw a, a statistic this week that 95% of professing Christians in the church have not led anyone to the Lord in their entire life. 95%. So I'm here to tell you this morning, if you've ever led somebody to the Lord and actually led them to the Lord and they were saved, you're in the 5%. We need more than 5%, amen? We need people to come in and tell people about Jesus Christ because there's a dying world out there. And I remember going back and I remember watching people jumping from the buildings. I remember people's discussion in church, church people's discussions. Oh, did they go to hell because they jumped from the building and things because they committed suicide and all these things? Really, man? That's your discussion? Let me tell you something. As a fireman, I promise you, I'd jump from that building instead of being burned up. That's a dreadful death. Let's think we need to remember that today. When we, when we say we remember it, let's really remember the sacrifices that are given for us. The ones that protect our community, the ones that are there. I think so many times we take it for granted. And I can tell you as a lady, if you turn on the TV, there's not one time. There's a, there's a, there's a deputy, I mean a police officer right now, I don't know all the details. But he's, he's being tried right now for manslaughter and killing because he tased the guy and the guy died. I, I said there's two sides there, but actually three sides. It's his side, your side, and then the truth, too. And so you never know really what comes out of that, but you know what? Our, our police officers are scrutinized like that like crazy right now. You know what? And, and you know, used to, if you ran from the cops, uh, they had every right to do whatever they had to do to get you. Nowadays, they have no rights. The criminals have more rights than the, than, the, than, the cop, than the cops do. And that's what our world's become to. But you know what? The church has allowed it to come to that. So I think as a church, we need to take a stance. Say, Amen. Take a stance on what we believe and what God's will. Amen? Thank you so much this morning for being a part of that. I hope you do remember too. Where are you at, what you were doing, and, and uh, I hope you remember that God is in control. And I hope if you're not, you'll get back in church and be active in church and serving the church and serving God's people and reaching out to the lost and the lost and dying world out there that needs to hear the gospel. Amen?
to do with that. I forgot also the nominating committee needs to meet right after the service this morning. Uh, meeting the fall service in the library is a brief moment. Against the way. You see the way capitalized? 
What is the way? Jesus. We talked about it last week, didn't we? Jesus is the way. See, when you, you publicly speak against the way, be careful. He's the creator of all things. God created you. He brought you into this world. He's the only one to take you out. I believe the scripture says, the Lord giveth and judge. The Lord giveth the Lord what? Take it away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Amen. But some became stubborn, rejecting his message and publicly speaking against the way. So Paul left the synagogue and took the believers with him. Then he held daily discussions at the lecture hall in Tyrannus. This went on for the next two years so that people throughout the province of Asia, both Jews and Greeks, heard the word of the Lord. I hope that's what you came here for today. I hope you didn't come to hear Todd Green speak. I hope you came to hear from the word from the Lord. Because if you didn't, you came for the wrong reason. God's word is powerful. Man's word is not. God's word changes lives. God's word changes lives forever. God's word converts us. Man's word does not. Man's opinion leads people to hell. But the word of God is powerful. Amen. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we love you today. We thank you for mercy, God. We thank you for grace. We thank you, Lord, that you are in control of all things. We thank you that you're all powerful, Lord. We thank you that in your Son, Jesus Christ, there's no other name greater. God, we thank you in the name of Jesus, 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 for your love for being with us this morning. We thank you, Lord, for your Holy Spirit's presence in this place. I pray, Lord God, that you would bind and rebuke Satan that he have no strongholds in this place today. In my life or anyone else's, Lord, that you would be glorified in it all. And that, Lord, you would be lifted on high this morning. We want to glorify your name. We want to worship you this morning. Lord, I pray that we would just come together today, Lord God, to hear what you would have to speak to us. And that, Lord, our lives would be changed. And we would lead differently than when we came in. Thank you, God, for the wonderful crowd that's here this morning, Lord Jesus. I pray, Lord, that, that everyone would receive the message that you would have them to receive this morning. God, I thank you for speaking to me this week, Lord Jesus. I thank you, God, for the power of your word in my life. I thank you, Lord, for the reminder in our Sunday school lesson this morning, Lord. And even in the little things, Lord, we're to rejoice. Not just in the big things, but you're the same God on the mountaintop. You're the same God that's with us in the valleys. And we love you and we give you praise, honor, and glory in Jesus' name. And everyone say, Amen. This morning I want us to look at these verses. And as we look at these verses, I've entitled the, the, the verses as we break down religiosity. First, in verses 1 through 3, let's look at the difference between being religious and being real. Uh, I think there's a huge difference in that. I think Christians, Christians today, uh, I've heard this week, I heard someone tell me that uh, their, their family member was dating a girl, and she was, they were dating a girl that uh, said she didn't go to church and she didn't want to go to church because there was nothing but a bunch of hypocrites there. Uh, well, she's one of them. I'm one of them. You're one of them. None of us are Jesus the last time I checked, right? So if we're not Jesus and we're, we call ourselves Christians is to live like Christ, we're not living like Christ. So we're still hypocrites, but we're saved by the blood of the Lamb. That's where grace comes in. Amen? Thank God for the New Testament covenant of grace that Jesus gave for us and His blood was shed for us. To wash us white as snow, to take away my sins yesterday, today, and tomorrow. His grace is sufficient. Religiosity is not where we need. Religiosity doesn't mean anything because there's religious believers today. If you look here in Scripture, when Paul arrived in Ephesus, he encountered several some disciples. And as he encountered some of these disciples in 12, about 12 is what the scripture says, they were not at this point strictly Christian disciples, but rather the disciples of John, the Baptist. They didn't say John the Methodist, did it? I love to tease their Methodist friends. And uh, somebody sent me something this week I thought was really cool. They said, uh, they said well, uh, there's, there was a fire in the Methodist church and the sprinkler system went off and, and it's, everyone in there got wet and everything and then everybody got saved and baptized that day all in one service. It was pretty cool to see. So if you don't get that, that's because they believe in strengthening most of them. Some do believe in full submersion baptism, but it was a joke, joke somebody shared with me this week. I thought it was pretty cool, pretty good. But here's the thing. Can I tell you this? They're going to be Methodists in heaven. Amen? They're going to be Presbyterian in heaven. Amen? They're going to be Pentecostal in heaven. Amen? It's not just Baptists. It's not, this, is, this, is, this is not just the Baptists. This was John the Baptist that they were talking about. He had his disciples, his followers. Luke used the term disciples for followers of John the Baptist in Luke chapter 5. In verse 33, in Luke chapter 7, in verse 18. And who writes Acts? Who writes Acts? Luke. 
Luke's the doctor. Many doctor references are given here. Luke writes Acts, and so if Luke, Luke refers to John the Baptist and his disciples that are following John the Baptist in, in Luke chapter 5, verse 33, Luke chapter 7, verse 18, he might have found a fine distinction between Baptist and Christian disciples. Strain for, <clears throat> for him, a true disciple of John, a completed disciple of John, was a Christian. That is the whole point in the present narrative here. They were only religious believers. Why? Because if we look at repentance without receiving the truth, it's not full repentance. See, when you receive Jesus Christ, you receive all of Him. The Bible says He's the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through Him. Repentance without receiving the truth is not full repentance. You can turn away from something on your own. You can, you can stop something on your own and it never really be fully stopped because you've never really turned it over. As I shared with you many times in my testimony on, on, uh, on smoking, I quit smoking and started dipping and, and God convicted me and it's not, not, not preaching against smoking this morning. I'm telling you that that's a, that's a thing that God's got to convict you in. You know what? If God has to convict you to quit smoking, you're not going to quit. God convicted me to quit smoking. I quit smoking. I started dipping. I thought justification. We love, we love to do that, don't we? As people, we just love to justify what we do. So I started dipping, and next thing you know, I was like, okay, well, if God convicts me to do that, I quit. Well, God convicted me to quit do that by a 14-year-old kid that was in our youth group, and next thing you know, I quit for about a year and a half, and I started back. When I started back, I was like, okay, God, I, I took this back on myself, you know. I didn't really truly give it to you. After I fully said, God convicted me and said, hey, you know what? You're giving that to me twice now, and now it's time for you to really give it to me. And I really gave it to him, and as I did, next thing you know, he opened up the door for me to go back home to my home church and minister to wonderful young people in our church who were great youth, and one's here today, matter of fact, I just married her and her new husband, they're newlyweds, and they're still on their still on their honeymoon, so I hope at least for the next 28 or 29 or 30 or 50 years, and, and uh, it's a privilege to do that, but I, as, I, as I thought about that, you know, that, that didn't happen until I was obedient. That hit didn't happen until I fully turned it over to God and said, here you go, God. I know you convicted me of it, you know. Maybe that's not, God hasn't convicted you of it. You know, that's the thing when people say, oh, what? Well, I haven't found anywhere in my Bible that somebody who smokes is going to hell. You, your body's a temple. You should treat it like that. Yeah, it is. But a lot of people will say, have, have a problem with people who smoke and people who drink and people who, 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 who dip and all those things. And, and the Bible does say not be drunk. Amen? It does tell us not to be drunk. It says be controlled by the what? Spirit. I, I, I don't know about you, but I don't want to be drunk in the spirit. You'll see what happens right here in a few minutes when they get drunk in the spirit. Amen? Paul's interrogation of the disciples revealed at no point had they advanced beyond John the Baptist's initial preaching of the repentance in preparation for the coming Messiah. Their reply, we haven't even heard that there is a Holy Spirit, is proof that they had not fully received the truth. So here's, here's what, it's not a separate baptism. Now let me tell you something. There's a lot of people that tell you it's a separate baptism because of this right here. They haven't even heard of it. See, if you come to church and you've heard that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and when He was sending into heaven, what did He leave here with us? Because He promised us He'd never leave us nor forsake us, right? So when He ascended into heaven, He had to leave part of Him here with us, which was what? The Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit, amen? And so when He's with us, that's a promise that God made us. And so, you know what? When I said, God, I'm yours. I surrender my all. I give my life to you. And you know what? I was baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. This tells you, this scripture proves that what happened was these guys existed before Jesus came to be baptized by John the Baptist. I'll prove that to you in just a second. Man's baptism is not enough. See, they were baptized just by John. He said, whose baptism were, were, you, were you baptizing? He said, I was baptized by John. They hadn't even heard of the Holy Spirit, so they hadn't, couldn't have heard about Jesus either. But he told them that the Messiah was coming, but they didn't realize, they didn't hang on to that part. So understand something. We come to church sometimes and we take half the message out with us and we use it as we want to and apply it to our lives. Take the whole message of the gospel. That he came, that he conquered. Amen? Thank God I serve a conqueror. Amen? I shared with someone recently, they would tell me, they, were, they were like, hey, hey, I just want to tell you something. Um, you know, I. I was really scared in this situation and blah, blah, blah. And I said, man, really? I said, can I be real with you, man? I, I'm just telling you the way God's dealt with my heart. There's not a man or woman or anything in this entire world that intimidates me. I don't care how big they are. I don't care how bad they are. 
Share with me tonight. I've had my high knee whipped before. Probably won't be the last time I have it whipped. I share with them as a, as a Marine. I went into a tough man contest one night and thought I was big and bad and loved the fight. And I walked in and the first guy I got into a, 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 the first fight with, a, I knocked him out. And the next fight, I didn't even get to breathe. And the guy hit me right in the jaw and knocked me slam on my back. And I looked at the guy and said, when's it start? And my buddy said, dude, you got knocked out. It happens. Man means nothing to what God means. You see, when Jesus Christ showed up on the scene, he told John, he said, I need to be baptized by you. I need to be baptized by you. And John said, no, you need to be baptized. I need to be the one. You need to be the one baptized with me. You don't need to be baptized with me. He said, no, we need to do what all God requires. And then that's where you see the first picture of the Trinity in the Bible. When John baptizes Jesus, it says, The Spirit of the Lord ascended upon him like a dove, and a voice from heaven called out and said, This is my Son in whom I'm well pleased. And he baptized him in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. You with me? These believers were before that time, or even they didn't finish listening to the message. They were not fully converted to that time. The baptism from the pastor or man means nothing without the heart and mind change that comes from being baptized in John and receiving the Holy Spirit. I want to share with you, Matthew Jackson's coming this morning to be baptized this morning. I'm not telling you this to embarrass him. I'm telling you this because I could see God in him just on the phone. I didn't have to see him. I didn't have to see him to, to talk to him when he called me and said, Hey man, you know what? I just got, I got a question for you. I could hear it in his voice and I could hear surrenderance. And he was broken. Right or wrong, brother. See, when God breaks you, let me, let me tell you the beautiful hard part of the whole story here is this. It's not the man's baptism that means anything. It's God. I said to Crystal, I, I immediately hung up and I called his brother. I was like, hey man, I just got to tell you this. And he, told, he, he called him and he was like, I guess God already told you. The, the crazy thing about the whole thing, we came here almost eight years ago in January. The only family we knew anything about in Sharpsburg was the Jackson family. We went over to visit Mr. and Ms. Jackson. We talked to them. And next thing you know, I was like, hey, that's the only family we know, Crystal. Then all of a sudden, the girls started coming and asking them to get up the girls and get them all ready, get them all dressed and things and all. And then all of a sudden, I had the privilege of baptizing every one of them. What a privilege. Amen? And then all of a sudden... He, he calls me and he's like, hey, can my brother help me in this baptism? He understood it wasn't me baptizing him. It wasn't his brother baptizing him. It was God saying, hey, the old you is gone. It's washed away and you come up clean. Because here's what I said to him. I said, bro, I'm so proud of you. You know what his next words to me was? It feels so good. Let me tell you something, though. That's when the battle begins. Why? Because we see what religiosity brings. Now let's see what realism brings. The battle begins when we surrender. It's easy to say, hey God, I give my life to you. God, I surrender to you. I give my all to you. I die to my old self every day, God. My, my baptism in water and showing people is that, God, what you've done on the inside of me, God, I want people to understand that you changed my life and I've died to death and sin and I'm raised in life with Jesus Christ, as the scripture says. Amen? If we look at realness in verses 4 through 7, believing the Messiah has come, it's real. As Paul's statement in verse 4 is a critical point. John's baptism was a baptism of repentance, preparatory to the coming of the Messiah. John's entire role as a forerunner was to prepare the people for the Messiah's coming. The Messiah was indeed, has indeed come. He is Jesus. Amen? Everybody say his name. Jesus. Who's the Messiah? Jesus. As they say in Israel, Yeshua, Hamashika, which means Jesus, the Messiah. Amen? The Messiah has indeed come. He's Jesus. Thus, to be a true disciple of John was to confess Jesus. For he is the one whom John had heralded. The real deficiency for those 12, or these 12 or so men, is, is so that they're not, it's not their baptism. It was much more serious. They failed to recognize Jesus as the one whom John had proclaimed as the promised Messiah. To be real, we must believe the Messiah has come. See, the crazy thing about Judaism is this. They don't believe the Messiah has come. The sad part is they, there's no hope if you don't have no Jesus. 
There's no hope. There's not enough animals on the entire earth that you can sacrifice to forgive your sin. There's nothing that I could do to be saved from hell. Let's Jesus Christ come. That's where we get total depravity from. You know, I'm totally depraved. I, can't, I cannot save myself. I'm only saved through God who sent His one and only Son. Believing the Messiah has come is part of realness. Secondly, is the Spirit is always a part of one's commitment to Christ and a mark of every believer. I teased said last week, uh, someone said to me, said, you know what? Said, he needs to smile a little more. He needs to smile a little more when he's up there singing and everything too. I shared, you know, and I was like, okay. I said, he probably does. So somebody stuck their tongue out at him last time. Try to give him a smile. So I was told afterwards he stuck his tongue right back out. <laughs> I bet they smiled. You know what? God wants us to smile because we should be joyous in the fact that we got Jesus. If the Spirit is a part of one's commitment to Christ and the mark of every believer, if we have the Holy Spirit living in us, it's hard for us to walk around looking like we're sucking on a limb. Amen? Amen. It's hard for us to walk around looking like this. There's no way the Spirit's in you. Oh, that's judgmental, Pastor. No, it's not. It's the truth. Here it is. It's important to note that God's pattern for today is given in Acts 10, verse 43 to 48. Sinners hear the Word. They believe on Jesus Christ. They immediately receive the Spirit. And then are baptized. The Gentiles in Acts 10 did not receive the Spirit by means of water baptism or by laying on of the apostles' hands like the Samaritan disciples did in Acts chapter 8. See, people focus on, okay, well, you had to lay your hands on them in order for to receive the Spirit. No, you didn't. It didn't happen in, in, in Acts chapter 10, but it happened in Acts chapter 8 with the Samaritan, the Samaritan disciples. The fact that these men did not have the Spirit. Dwelling in them was proof that they had never truly been born again. But listen to what it said in the Scripture. They were believers. But they were believers in John the Baptist. As they were followers of John the Baptist. Are you with me? Because when you receive Jesus, He changes your life. He changes your life. They had the religious knowledge but something was missing. The Holy Spirit. This was a special group of men, however. They would help form the nucleus of the great church at Ephesus. You've got to understand this. As the Ephesians, in the book of Ephesians, Paul is writing to the church of Ephesus. This is the nucleus of that church. This is the nucleus who, who created, they were full of the Holy Spirit. See, you can't create the church, and you can't be the church unless you're full of the Holy Ghost. Don't believe it? Read your scripture here. Study it. This was the nucleus and the core of the church. These twelve, it was a special group. They would help them form the nucleus of the great church in Ephesus by using Paul to convey the gift of the Spirit. God affirmed Paul's apostolic authority and united the Ephesian church to the other churches as well as the mother church in Jerusalem. Real salvation is not revealed by the gift. What do you mean by that? It simply is. It's revealed in their life, through our actions. You know what? If I give you a million dollars, if I was a millionaire and I just gave you a million dollars, you don't become a millionaire until you have that money, right? Gifted million things. You don't become a millionaire either once you spend one dollar over one penny of it because you're not a millionaire any longer. Amen? You're 999,999 whatever thousand dollars. Amen? <laughs> Ninety-nine cents. One penny less if you're not a millionaire. It's through the gift of Jesus Christ that it happened in their lives will change. There are some that use this, these verses to say that people weren't truly saved if they don't speak in tongues. Let's dig into this for a minute today. Our salvation is not, be, not, not based off the gift, uh, a certain gift. Amen? Our salvation is based off the gift, Jesus Christ. Verse 6 says this. They spoke in other tongues and prophesied. See, so many people are scared to talk about this in church today because they don't understand it. They've never really studied it. And God, God forbid somebody break out speaking tongues and everything and somebody be like, oh, oh, what the world? But then when an interpreter comes over and interprets it, it's amazing how godly it really is. See, that's what God's Word says. Speaking in tongues isn't wrong. But it must be interpreted. Many times it's misused. 
Many times it's used to edify the self. The, the Bible says it should be used to edify the church, to edify God. What is the church? Not the building. What is the church? The body of Christ. Our salvation is based off the gift. In, listen to this. Paul asked in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, how, how do you prove this, Pastor? That, that, that the gift of tongues is not evidence of the baptism of the Spirit or the fullness of the Spirit? It's because, in, in, take notes, write this down. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 30. What did Paul ask the Corinthian church? Who was a corrupt church? Who was someone who was trying to use the gifts inappropriately? And he's writing to them and he says to them this. Do we all have the ability to speak in unknown languages? Of course not. Of course not. He said, do we not all have the ability to interpret? Of course not. So therefore, that doesn't mean that because I don't speak in tongues, I'm not saved. That doesn't mean that at all whatsoever. See, some people have the gift of speaking in tongues. Some people have the gift of interpreting. All of us have different gifts. Amen? But if you're not living your life for God, it will reveal itself and it will show it to the entire world. And if Satan's got control of your life, it will eventually come out. But when you're living in the Spirit, I can tell you this, friend, there's no high I've ever been on in my entire life that's greater than being high in Jesus. When the jailer and his family were saved through the, their belief in Jesus Christ and were baptized by Paul and Silas in Acts chapter 16, there was no mention of speaking in tongues, was it? Hold on a minute, though. He laid hands on them, didn't he? They got saved, didn't they? They were baptized, the whole family, right there at 3 o'clock in the morning. God forbid. I was talking to a friend of mine, Pastor Sweet, he was like, hey man, y'all got a baptism on Sunday? You know you can't do baptism once a quarter. <laughs> really, man? I think he's joking with me for He said, yeah, that's, I have served in the church one time and said we couldn't do baptism once a month or once a quarter. I said, man, let me tell you this. Jesus baptized at what? Conversion. What did Paul baptize the jailer and his whole family at 3 o'clock in the morning and baptize them? So, yes, we do give people an opportunity to invite people to come. We don't baptize them. I, I would have come home on Wednesday and said, hey, man, be here Wednesday night. Come on, come Wednesday night. Yes, sir. All day long. Tell your brother, be here. The whole family be here if they be here. But we want to give them an opportunity to be here. That's why we do that. You also see, too, when Paul wrote to the Ephesian friends about the filling of the Holy Spirit, he said nothing about speaking in tongues in Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 18. Take your notes, write that down. He says, hey, you're being filled with the Holy Spirit. He didn't say anything about speaking in tongues. Just, that's just one sign. Are you with me this morning? It should not be our focus. Our focus should be on fully receiving the Holy Ghost living in us. Because that's why we shouldn't fear it. Because God's in control. Which another Sunday school lesson was awesome. You should be in Sunday school. Amen. Sunday school lesson this morning was powerful. We learned last week about, about, about Elijah. If you don't know the story, read your Bible in that. Read your, read your Bible in Kings. In 1 Kings, I believe it is. He says, you know what? He comes down and he's like, hey, call, call, call Baal down. He's got 450 men in front of him. And he's standing there by himself with 450 men. And he's like, hey, call down. Let's, let's do this. Let you call on your God, and then I'll call on my God. I'm going to build this altar right Y'all build this altar right here. And he gave them the ox to build it with. He's like, here you go. Take this. Take this fine ox right here. Put it on the altar, because he knew what would happen. And he built an altar up. They built an altar up. They put the ox on the altar. And they said, oh, Baal, come down. The fire from Baal, come down. And, oh, they danced, and they sung, and they hollered. And they said, Elijah, I love God's word. Amen. He's got a sense of humor. If you don't know God's got a sense of humor, you ain't ready to work. Elijah said, maybe he's taking a break. <laughs> Call a little louder. Maybe he can't hear you. Paraphrase, maybe he need to turn his hearing aid up a little bit. Maybe he can't hear you. <laughs> then he says this, maybe he's relieving himself. Maybe he's gone to the bathroom. Maybe he's taking a bathroom break. This goes on and on and on. And this is crazy. He lets him go all day into the night. And then all of a sudden he says, okay, my turn, big boys. <laughs> And he builds his altar up. And then he douses it down. Not one, not two, but how many times? Three times with water. Soaks the wood down. And then he takes a trench around it. And he puts water all in the trench around it. And then all of a sudden he calls one time for the fire of God to come down. And the fire of God came down. And not only did it consume the offering of the ox and all the wood, but all the stones. Have you ever seen a stone burn and be gone? 
No, because we build our little fire pits with them, don't we? We build our fire pits out of stone. They might get black, but they don't, they don't, they, they don't go away. They don't, they, don't, they don't disintegrate. The Bible says everything was gone, including the water that was in the trenches around it was lapped up. Because the power of the Holy Ghost. Amen? God is powerful. Therefore, here's the thing, and, and it goes in the next, very next part in our Sunday school lesson today was Jezebel threatens him. So what's he do? Like most good uh, Christian cowards do, they just got like to see it, bro, for real. They tuck their tail between their legs, and what do they do? Let me tell you something. I learned in the Marine Corps a long time ago, five years, after duty in the Marine Corps, we don't retreat. We don't retreat. And I'm going to show you in this scripture right here today, Paul didn't retreat. He took it with him. He took it with him. Because as we see here, I want to show you something today too in this. Before we get to number three and close out, our real salvation is not revealed through a gift, but through Jesus Christ, and He gives each of us different gifts. Let us seek our realness instead of religiosity. Religious people kill Jesus, amen? Christians love Him. As we see in someone shared with me this week, I want to share this with you. It was awesome. And it's spoken to me highly this week. God has just used it in my life over and over around me every day. I read it every day. A pastor never gets to say I'm off duty, never gets to punch out at five, never gets to have a normal schedule. We don't know how many sleepless nights they spend on their knees praying for their church, how much opposition they face, how many family opportunities they miss to meet with hurt people. We can't carry their burden for them, but we can do what the Bible tells us to do. Pray for them, encourage them, support them. By blessing them, we will only be blessed in return. Thank the person who shared that with me this week. Because I can tell you this, last night I got home and while well, I was ready, I, I, I was prepared. Let me rephrase that. I've never been ready to preach. I was prepared. Stephen Ferg said this week, I'll share Laura sent me a video this week on Elevation Church. He said, watch this video. Check this out. Watch this, this sermon. And as I looked at the sermon, one of the parts of the sermon that spoke to me, and Chris and I found out later, it spoke to her in the same part, is to look back. And you know, in January, I look back on eight years of ministry here at this church, and I see God moving tremendously. Uh, the power of this. I'm not a numbers guy. If anybody knows me, I'm not a numbers guy at all whatsoever. I can care less about numbers on realness. But the truth of the matter is, statistics don't lie. I mean, Matthew will make the 17th person we baptized this year, and it's only September. Praise God. Amen. Amen. Four people come by faith and faith and have already been baptized and feel like God's called them here at our church. As a serving member. Amen? To be real. The sad part is, I spoke with a friend of mine recently and said their church baptism hadn't been used in three years and they're in their area and in our association. <clears throat> I'm thankful we've had a leak in baptism. I'm thankful we've had a baptism to baptize somebody in. I'm so thankful this week that I like to bust in my tail in it this week, Trisha and, and the girls. I'm sorry. Uh, there was slime in it, okay? So y'all might have that in your hair. It's good for your hair, though. That's what I told been told for the pool place. I stepped down in it this week and went in there backing the whole thing out, and I had to wait till Glenda left just in case I fell down because I forgot my, my, my bathing suit. And I thought, man, I'm in trouble, big time trouble here. So I had to hike my pants all the way up. It was pretty sad. I'm glad you didn't see this church. <laughs> Got up, sucked up all the water off to it, and went in there and cleaned everything from top to bottom down, and then filled it back up, and then said to the guys at the pool, hey, what do I do? I don't know nothing about a pool. They said, put an algae eater in there, put this in there, and then put some shocker in there, and all. And now it's clean now, after you get the clean stuff. They didn't get the clean stuff. <laughs> but I'm thankful for it. I'm thankful that it's not leaking. I, I came out, and I went and looked underneath there. I crawled underneath on my knees, and I got home, and my, my, my bad knee was completely deformed. I told Chris, I said, look at this whole side was flat. And we're crawling on the rocks underneath there to try to get under Baxter to cut the valves off the thing. You do what you got to do, man. Because God called us to be real. I want to see lives changed, amen? 
I don't know about you. I'm thankful for 17 baptisms in our church this year. I'm thankful for four professions of faith to say the sake of faith I've been baptized for. And I want to join membership with this church. And I want to be a body of believers, to join this body of believers to keep pushing forward and moving on and allowing the Holy Spirit to work in our lives to be real. Because why? Because He wants us bold. Boldness is in Jesus. Amen? Amen. We talked about it last week. Paul entered the synagogue. What happened? He was kicked out of the synagogue. What did he do? He went right next door to the synagogue, didn't he? He didn't stop preaching the gospel. He went right next door. And the leader of the synagogue got saved. <laughs> well, if that don't get you, something's wrong with you. That don't let you whistle something wrong. The leader of the Jewish synagogue got saved. And Paul goes right next door and says, Hey, I'm starting in one right here in somebody's house. Here we go. Oh, they were mad. They called him out. They wanted him to be, what? Stoned. Wanted to be locked up. He said, I can't lock him up. Then they realized they, that Paul had some Jewish in him. They were like, ooh, hold up. He didn't know that. Let me back up here. We just assumed. You're from Rome? You're Jewish? What? Paul was powerful. And God used him. But let me make sure you understand something. Paul was a nasty, dirty, rotten sinner that had murdered Christians. You understand that? But as Billy Webb preached in our church several years ago, when he was walking down the road, he met a man named Jesus, and his life was changed. And it gave him boldness. Paul preached again in the synagogue. We know that Paul was filled with the Holy Spirit, and this gave him a boldness to preach. As was customary with Paul, he began to witness his witness in the Jewish synagogue. In spite of being run out several times before, we are to stay the course. Finish the race. Stand on the Word of God and preach Jesus Christ with boldness in the church. We're to stay true to our calling. Paul made a preliminary appearance in the Ephesian synagogue and he had, that he had been asked to stay in Acts chapter 18 and verse 19. And now he was fulfilling the invitation through a longer presentation of Jesus Christ to them. The Ephesian Jews seemed to, be, had, seemed to have an openness to his witness because it says there that all the time during his debate he was there for how many months? You read the scripture with me there? Three. Verse 8, three months. So check this out. He was there for three months, and then all of a sudden he started facing opposition. They loved him for three months. Then he faced opposition. I had a pastor tell me when I first came here to this church, I was like, man, went to, went to the church that I actually started ministry at at Oak Road. He was a the pastor there at the time, and he said, hey, brother, he said, how's things going? I said, man, they're going awesome. Things are going great. He was like, it's okay, you're in your honeymoon period. It'll wear off after you. That ticked me off. I mean, I ain't talking to that dude no more. I'm going to discourage somebody, man. Really? I didn't even want to get past him. But I know that's where God called me. I know I'm doing what God's called me to do. You're going to discourage me like that? Really, man? Then I realized, you know what? He was right. He was right. Thank God that everything I've ever gone through in ministry, somebody told me about it beforehand. Amen? Steve Webb told me five things I'd go through in this church, and I've gone through all five of them already. God sent the messenger. God sent the messenger to tell me, hey, this is coming. Be prepared for it. Know it's coming. Be ready. It's a whole lot easier when you're ready. Amen? It's a battle. It's a battle to live a Christian life. It's a battle to live in ministry. It's a battle to pastor. It's a battle you're going to face. Him. You're going to face Paul face what? What did it say he faced after three months? Opposition. Oh, they were good for three months listening to it. But then all of a sudden they realized it was the truth and realized they had to change. Mm, 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 mm. People don't like change, do they? Let's be real this morning, honestly. We don't like change, do we? And we're setting our ways. We like, this is how I was raised. This is how I've done it. This is how I've done it all my life for all these years and all these things. Let me ask you something. Do they still teach school today like they did back in 40 years ago? No. Why? Why? <laughs> There's one of <laughs> Why else do that? Why, why did they not teach the same way they taught 40 years ago? Because 40 years ago, they didn't know anything about what? ADHD, ADD? They didn't know anything about all that stuff, did they? They just knew, hey, you had to class and get that tail toy with a belt. <laughs> Spare the rod, beat that child. Man. That's all they know. God forbid all of us who went through that generation here think we're ADD. Mama, I know you're listening in the nursery. Shame on you. <laughs>
To do the same thing over and over again and expect a different result is called insanity, amen? Can I tell you this, though? There's still cheeks in the same things. Are you with me? Just in a different way. The message is still the same, except for they've added something to it. You know that. Or if they taught sex education in 5th and 6th grade like they do now back in the day, or from the hands of the spent, wasn't it? <laughs> well, you can tell my children about that. Let me tell my children about that. Well, hey, church, let me tell you something. Tell your children about it. You start talking to your children about it, and the school won't have to. I said, well, why? I said, I cannot believe you said something to Abby. She's eight years old, Crystal. She asked. I don't care. Tell them you talk about it later. <laughs> <laughs> and then I was like, oh, thank you, Lord. Thank you for giving that to Crystal and not me. Thank you, God, that she had been taught to daddy. I'd be like, let's see you fall. <laughs> <laughs> You're a girl. Say, we'll talk to you. You're a girl. He'll see you. Preaching in the synagogue, you know. Crystal shared something recently. The Ephesian Jews seem to be have been open to his witness because he was there for three months. But you know what? When opposition rose, rest assured, when you speak the truth boldly, opposition arises. Amen. Crystal shared something with me recently. She said, you know what? And I really started thinking about it. I thought, that's, just, that's so true. She was like, you can be there for everybody when they have a test done, when they have a CT scan done, and bring them. you can be there to go witness to their friends. You can be there to go. Every time they call you, you can go. Oh, there's been a time they don't call you, and they say, what are you at? Let me, let me make sure you understand something. When the pastor doesn't have ESP, he only has ESP, and that's on the TV. Right? That's like, I just watch that. You don't call me, I don't know. If you call Glenda and tell her not to tell me, she ain't going to tell me. She has to keep that anyway. But here's the thing. Here's what she said to me, and it's true. I thank God for a wife being honest with me. Amen? She said, you can go and do everything you can do, and all you can do, and do everything, and be there every single time they need you, every single time this and that, but you let one thing happen. You let one, somebody say one thing about you, and you pick it ain't true. Give my response to her. And you as a church. It is Jesus. Thank you, God. She wasn't discouraged. She was speaking to me. She was speaking truth. Thank you, God, for reminding me that they did it to Jesus too. Can I remind you of something? I'm still fat. I ain't got flesh grip from my side, ain't I need some, I need fat grip from it, but I don't need no flesh grip from it. But I, I ain't got no flesh grip from my side. Ain't nobody spit in my face yet. And I can promise you, I would not be Jesus in that. I promise you, I ain't be nothing. Be serious. I would ask for forgiveness after His grace is sufficient yesterday, today, and tomorrow. After you spit in my face and I knock you in the jaw. And I'll just take your face and spit it mine. Hey, I'm being real. I'm human just like you are. I make mistakes just like you do. Well, I try every day to be more like Jesus Christ. If I didn't, I, stand, I couldn't stand before you today, honestly. I didn't finish. I just got the first class. Amen. Amen. To be prepared for the battle, to be preached in the synagogue. Not all reject the truth, though. That's what I want to share with you today in the message I heard you Not all reject the truth. Only a few. But the few have always, the minorities have always had the loudest voice. You know, they need to look at that. Search our government. Look at our government. Look and see what's happened. The minority always has the loudest voice. Why do you think it is? It, look, it's not a black white issue. I support Richard Burke. Hey, I voted for Richard Burke. I support Richard Burke completely, honestly. And he's, he's done. I, mean, I know a lady, Betty Jo Shepard, who's in our community in Rocky Mountain. I've known her since I was a little bitty kid. She works in for his office, and she worked at Rosemar Rocky Mountain office for him. I've known her since I was a little bitty kid. But I saw a commercial recently that I thought, hmm. Hmm. It was a pastor from Raleigh. Just so happened to be black. Okay, let's not let's not take the picture this morning. Let me make sure you understand where I'm going here. Most white people are, let's go parties here, Republican. Most black people are Democrats, right or wrong. Okay, let me tell you this. But all should be Christian. Amen? Makes no difference. Republican don't get you into heaven. Democrat don't get you into heaven. Libertarian don't get you into heaven. Only Jesus does. 
But here's what I saw in this commercial. You might have seen it. There's a black pastor in Raleigh. And he's talking about all that Richard Burr has done, and every person in the commercial is black. Let me ask you a question. Who's he trying to reach? There you go. There you go. You with me? He's stupid. He wants all the votes. He wants everybody. He wants all the votes in it. Here's the thing. Not all people reject the truth. Not all people reject that. I don't reject him because of that. I'm saying, I know what he's doing. I see his campaign. His campaign's at work. If you think for one minute that Richard Burr, or Donald Trump, or Hillary Clinton, or any of them are going to fix their country, you're in for a world of hurt. And let me remind you, read your scripture. Does it say anything about the United States in the end times? And yeah. praise God because it ain't here. Oh, that scared me. Every superpower nation in the entire world has fallen. Rome, Soviet Union, Ooh, Russian boy. The Soviet Union boy, they got destroyed, didn't they? Kadaki, he thought he was something, didn't he? Until they blew his house up. When they dropped the bomb on his house, Hitler thought he was something, didn't he? Got shut up, didn't he? Saddam Hussein thought he was something too, until they got him, didn't he? Bin Laden thought he was something, until they got him, didn't he? We're still over there playing in that stupid jump. I served it, I can say it. Every power country, all the way back and even to before Jesus is there. Oh, look at the power that they had. Look at all the Persia. Look at all, look at all they had. Babylon. What did they do? All of them what? Faith. And so the United States. Don't put faith in your country. I love my country. I'm thankful for our country. I serve my country. But I don't love my country more than I love my God. You see, even the Marine Corps Army has learned this. It's God for the country. See, first it's God. Then it's the Corps. Then it's your country. Because if you don't serve in the Corps, you might not have a country. We forgot those things that the people of the We forgot what that means. We forgot that how mad we were when we attacked our country. Oh, we're going to take a stand. No, we didn't. We stood up for a brief little bit to opposition party coming away. Then we took the tail from their legs like little dogs and we run off. He and on the floor. I thank God still us to stand up and be bold. Because you know what? Not all reject the truth. Understand there's going to be some that do. There's going to be some in the church that reject the truth. There's going to be some in the church that get bad lead. There's going to be some in the church that get bad stay. There's going to be some. I told you one time before. Let me ask you something. Do you think that I will please the entire church? I promise you I will. I bet you a thousand dollars right now, if I'm going to take that bet, that I will please the entire church at some point in time in the ministry here. If I'm going to take that bet? Yeah, I, 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 I will please some of them when I got here, and I will please the other part when I leave. They'll all be pleased some way or another. And when God calls, I'm going. When that day comes, I'm ready. I want to be prepared. I want to be there. Why? Because bring the truth to all people. Why? Because God will sort them out. Now the Marine Corps say it was, hey, we fill them all, let God sort them out. How about preach the truth and let God sort them out? He's the judge. He's a point in the mirror once that I live with. Bring the truth to all people with boldness. God has a plan. Paul continued to disciple the new converts in Ephesus. Listen to this. you got to understand something. Paul didn't just run. Okay? The scripture says he took the believers with him. He didn't leave them there. See, see they, they believed in John the Baptist, but they didn't believe on Jesus yet. When they believed on Jesus and he touched them, the Holy Spirit entered them. And when the Holy Spirit entered them, they started speaking in tongues and they started prophesying, which means to actually speak the true word of God. Amen? And as they started speaking the truth, they, they, the opposition started, and Paul said, hey, let's go, come on. I'm not going to leave you. I'm not going to leave you behind. I'm not going to leave you when you're a true believer. Understand something, that there's more believers in the church than there are opposition stand strong. That's what Paul did. Daily discussions, the Scripture says, he gave in Ephesus to the new converts in Ephesus. At the lecture hall. And this opened the door for people throughout the province of Asia. 
both Jews and Gentiles, to hear the word of the Lord. Can I tell you this? That's what we're to do as a church. To allow people to hear the word. You don't come to church to be seen. You don't come to church for what you wear. I was listening to a pastor this week and said, you know what? I think it was Greg Bach, if I'm not mistaken. Powerful, powerful to serve. Christian way. He said, one of the first things that people ask when I walk into our church is this. What do I wear? Y'all must say it too. He said, it's a shame that we've made it about in church what you have on the outside of your body. Because everybody that comes in the doors of the church has a soul. Everybody that comes in the church has a brain. Everybody that, well, everybody that comes in the church has a heart. And everybody that has a heart needs a heart change. Needs a transplant of that heart. I said you had a hold of me for 26 years of my life. But he don't matter. But he don't matter. Because the word of the Lord is preached a lot of times. We must proclaim the word of the Lord to all people. May we remember today that religiosity is not the way. Religiosity is not the way at all whatsoever. God is looking for realness. Too much faith going on in the world to we don't need any more. And through his realness, through the realness in our lives, God will give us boldness. A boldness to preach the truth that Jesus is the way. The only way. Jesus being the truth in the only way. Why? Because we've been set free in the Spirit. So that's what the Spirit did. The Jesus about 12 people, disciples of John. When the Holy Spirit got a hold of them, they were set free. You're no longer in a bondage. Sin can't hold on to you unless you let it. God doesn't force Himself into your life. He wants you to open the door. You see the pictures of uh, Jesus, what man thinks Jesus looks like anyway. You see the pictures of the door. You ever seen that picture? He's knocking on the door. If you're noticing every picture that was done with that, there's no handle on his side. He doesn't force his way in. He's waiting for you to open the door. God is love, and through his love, as the grace man comes at this time, through his love, he sent his one and only son, Jesus. Christ to pay a debt that he didn't, that we didn't, he could, we couldn't pay, and a debt that he didn't owe. It is through that love that Jesus rescued me, and He set me free. It's the same love that He has for you. Won't you set me set free today by the Holy Spirit of God? I want to tell you something today, honestly. It's freedom to live in the Spirit. It's bondage to live in Satan. That's why people look like this. That's why sometimes, sometimes people have to just put on a, a mask, a big, huge mask when they come to church. I was teasing the other day with Shane, and I said something to her about, why you got makeup on for today? I ain't never seen you wear makeup. Well, you know, I have put makeup on. I'm not saying this embarrassed. I'm saying this to tell you, she's a beautiful woman. She's a beautiful young lady, but God, amen. She ain't got to rebuke. Let me tell you something, ladies. You ain't got to impress nobody. God's already impressed with you. Let me tell you something, man. He already loves you. You don't have to audition for God. You already got the part. The audition's over. When you surrender, He's yours. He can get them all. When I open my arms up and I say, God, I surrender my life to you. I want you to come into my life. I want you to have complete control over me. I want you to be the Lord of my life. Not just my fire insurance policy from hell. I'm not coming to say some little prayer that man made up that's not even in the Bible. If you find a sinner's prayer in the Bible, you bring it to me, show it to me. 
Jesus spoke in a prayer in the Bible and told us that is our model prayer. He tells us in there, forgive me of my sins as I forgive others. See, you know, if you ain't forgiven others, you can't be forgiven. That's why you're miserable. Because it's got control of them. I just want to make you hear me never spread Today's your day. The Bible says today is the day of salvation. Amen? So maybe you're here today and you got a big battle to face. I know the one who can fix it. I know the one who's bold enough to fix it, who's powerful enough to fix it, who's powerful enough to step in and say, hey, I got you. Stay tall. What's that that's saying? Somebody help me to watch the whole bunch of movies. Walk tall and carry a big stick. Is that it? Am I right now? Is that it? Somebody help me. I know somebody watch it. Walk tall or carry a big stick. Speak softly and carry a big stick. There you go. Watch this. <clears throat> Speak boldly and carry a big sword. It slices and dices and cuts. Sometimes it hurts. Sometimes it cuts deep to the bone. Sometimes it's just superficial to remind you, hey, you better watch out. But the answer is all right there. Jesus came, 100% God, 100% man, got on a cross and died for something he never did sin. For a lost and dying world, he gave his all. That's what he wants from us. To be a Christian is to be like Christ, to give your all in him. You know what? Every battle that he faced, God was with you. Amen. Maybe you're going through the fire, and you know what? He promised you he'd be with you through that fire. He sets you free. He rescues you. Just stand to your feet this morning. God's about to be our heart. I'll come up to you. We'll pray. We've got prayer boards. We'll be glad, glad to pray with you this morning. Maybe you're here this morning and you never surrendered today. You know? Maybe you're here this morning and you, you surrendered your life to God and, and you know you're a blood-bought, born-again Christian and you'd like to be baptized. You'd like to come down and talk to me about it. I'll be glad to show with you God's Word while we believe in full support and baptism. Because it's the Word that God says that when Jesus came straightway up out of the water, which means He had to be under, that's why I believe in that. Be glad to share that with you. Maybe today you're here and you, you surrendered your life. You've been baptized in full submersion baptism. And, and you're here today and you say, hey, you know what? I want to be a part of the, the body of Christ. I want to be a believer and live and serve the Lord. And God's calling me here to this church. And that's you. What's your response to God's calling us?
Thank you. 